Welcome back to another week of Money in the Bank. This is Angie. With me again, I have Brett. Hey, great to be back. So I'm pretty excited about today's topic because I think this is like our life philosophy that we're just going to spill, right? It's like everything we love that we get to talk about. Absolutely. So today we're going to be talking about saving and getting in that mindset to like change your life and be like, I'm going to be a saver. So why don't we start this out with a good statistic because I love statistics. So, you know, I've been reading a lot of financial articles lately and I saw one that was kind of surprising to me because it said 31% of people have three to five months of their expenses saved up in an emergency fund. And I was like, wow, that actually seems pretty high, right? It's a good good number of people, like, yeah. more than I thought. One in three, you mm-hmm. know, and I was like, to me, because everyone always talks about how, like, you know, people don't have enough in savings and people aren't saving for retirement and, you know, millennials aren't saving for anything. We hear that all the time. <laughs> so I thought, like, you know, one in ten would have a well-funded emergency fund. So I, I heard that and I was like, that's pretty good. Well, then I heard that 60% of people have less than $500. In any type of emergency fund. Oh, so then, you know, that's everybody else. So it's... Right. So there's 9% of people in the middle. And <laughs> everybody else is either, like, saving or not saving. Right. So one or the other. So that, that means, you know, we, we had talked previously about, you know, when you're a kid and growing up, you know, getting the importance of, uh, you know, having the mindset of, of saving early on. Sounds like, sounds like. A third of people are are doing that and following that rule when they're growing into into adults, and everybody else is just disregarding it and just is on the spend 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 mentality. Yeah, well, and so you know, looking at that, I think the first thing I think a lot of people say is, "Well, I don't save because I don't make enough money." But if you're looking at a third of people, that's really not any type of specific there's no like great correlation with like oh it's just the one percenters that can save all this money right it's not like it's you know that small of a subgroup like 31 percent of people that's that's one in three that's that's covering a wide range of people who make forty thousand dollars hundred thousand dollars thirty thousand dollars you know all over the spectrum i think so um you know that to me kind of shows that It's not necessarily what you make, it's your mentality, and it's what you're choosing to do with what you make. Right, because if you're in the, you know, $50,000 range, it should be pretty comfortable for you to be able to put some money away and not have it really impact your lifestyle to to any degree, right? Yeah, well, and I think, you know, I think that $50,000 range, and, you know, we'll we'll talk about $50,000 as a no kid household, right? Because I think once you add kids in, it, it gets... It blows up and it gets way different. Um, but single single income yeah. or, or even dual income, of, you know, equating to about 50000 yeah. can, can work. And I think you have extreme people in that camp of you either make $50,000 and you're like, you know, maybe you got a new car and maybe you got a little nicer house and all of a sudden you've inflated your lifestyle. Like you can't really afford it and you're going to zero every month instead of being able to save everything versus like just making a couple tweaks of like, okay, you know, I'm going to drive my car until it, it, the wheels fall off and I'm going to, you know, maybe buy a little smaller house in a more modest neighborhood that I got 20% down for instead of 5% down for and making those like little decisions along the way. Well, and those are bigger decisions, but even making the little decisions of I'm going to pack my lunch or I refuse to buy coffee at the, you know, at Starbucks. Um, one of my good friends has a blog, a stanglife.blogspot.com. And I was actually looking at her blog today and she had like a picture of this really delicious latte. I was actually just at her house recently. Um, and she made me this latte and it's like, she breaks down on there. I think, you know, how cheap it is to make at home, like less than 50 cents or something. Meanwhile, you go to Starbucks and get this latte for like $5, you know, and it was so good when she made it for me, you know? And so I think... You, when you look at people that are, you know, she loves coffee. She's a great example. I love coffee. But when you break it down and you, like, find these little things that you can save so much money on, $5 does make a difference because every time you save that, the power of compound interest, 
it adds up. <laughs> right? Absolutely. But, you know, she didn't make it with that little foam heart in the in the top. So She didn't. That's I'm gonna, the difference. I'm going to have to get her to make those foam hearts. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, it, you know, everybody that is in the mentality that is a saver then, you know, they're sounds like they're doing the right thing. So if you are on the edge, if you're in that 9% and you, you want to push it or you're in that lower two-thirds percent, you know, what are some things people can do to get out of it? You mentioned, you know, maybe you're in over your head if you are if you got too much of a house, right? That's, you know, because too much of a house or too much of a car payment, you know, for, for where you are, or where your income level is, um, you know, that can that can take out a couple hundred bucks a month. We talked before, 350 bucks a month is what you would save and put away for an entire college education, right? Um, so, you know, thinking about it like that, yeah, if you can back it off, if you if you are in that situation, what do you do? Do you sell your house? Do you sell your car? Like, what so is the right answer? I think in some extreme cases, when you've gotten in over your head and you've inflated your lifestyle to a point that you can't afford it, and you probably don't know you can't afford it, but I'm telling you, if you can't save money, you can't afford your lifestyle. You've gone too far, um, which nobody wants to hear, so I'm sorry. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Um, but I think sometimes you have to get extreme. So... You know, if you find yourself racking up credit card debt to buy things that you want, you you can't afford your lifestyle. And sometimes that means extreme changes. So, you know, if you have that new car sitting in the driveway and you still owe $10,000 on it, but it's worth eighteen, dollars then I'm telling you, you might need to go sell that car, right? And you pay off the loan for ten, dollars and you take that $8,000 and you find a nice $5,000 Honda Civic, right? <laughs> maybe maybe six years old, 10 years old, you know, still has, maybe maybe only has 100,000 miles or so. You still have half its lifespan, right? Um, but not a Honda I mean, any car. You any, just buy a yeah, cheaper car. car. Yeah, car. Yeah. Right. Any $5,000 car. Then you take that $3,000 and you start paying off your debt, right? And you start digging out of that hole and you work really hard and you make it your goal and you make it your priority Because that's how you're going to make a difference. That's how you're going to turn your life around. That's how you're going to switch to being from that, you know, 60% to that 30%. Um, You know, I've I've budgeted with a lot of people. And I'm telling you, no matter how little money you think you're making, I can always find $50 to $100 a month in every single person's budget that's being wasted. Yeah, and I think it's the difference of, you know, the the mindset of those people that are in the 30%, how many of them do you think would say, you know, I can cut back on my savings? You know, I'm, I'm not, or I'm saving too much money. Well, I think, you know, a lot of them could cut back on savings, right? You can always cut back on savings. How many would, or how many would say, oh, I wish I didn't save so much money. I mean, I think once you start saving money, I think it's really addicting. And I think it, it gives you that sense of security and it gives you that sense of like, You know, if I work hard for something, I can literally get anything I want. And that's such a good feeling to have. So once you start on that road, I I really don't think you'll back off it, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, But something else I I want to talk about is, you know, I think a lot of people get trapped in this paycheck to paycheck cycle. So, you know, we've talked about how if you pay for six months of your car insurance at a time, it's actually cheaper than if you pay monthly because they charge you a premium to pay monthly. So if you're paying monthly right now and you're like, well, I'm never going to be able to afford, you know, especially we're in a no-fault insurance state, so I'm never going to be able to afford $1,000 for six months, find areas in your budget where you can even start saving, you know, $100 a month. And then in a year, you can switch to paying six months at a time instead of monthly. Right. And or, you know, borrow from other areas in your life, right? Save, Save up some money in some other areas. It doesn't have to just be... The car insurance, you know, money is dedicated to car insurance, you know, save up some money in some other areas, cut back on some other things, put that money down, you know, where you can, and then boom, it just frees up all that money you had tied up in the car insurance in the first place. And then you have, then you have all that money flexible for other areas to cut back on and do that same kind of compound savings. And it just is a, is basically a a snowball or avalanche effect for, you know, savings and on top of savings on top of savings and flexibility and freedom of your money rather yeah. than being a slave to the bills coming in every month. Right? right. Well, and I think, you know, a lot of people get to the point where they don't think they can save anymore. And I, I really just believe you can. So, you know, another example is groceries. I think food costs can range person to person so much. 
And a lot of times, if you just get a little bit better about meal planning in advance or shopping specials or shopping sales, you can save a lot of money. You know, I would 10, maybe 10 or 20% of your grocery bill you could cut off. So, you know, if you're a two person household spending $100 a week and all of a sudden you can cut that to 80 a week, then you just freed up $80 a month, you know, and that's $20 a week. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. a month. Yep. 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 So, um, you know, I think that matters. And, you know, when I was in college, like I was spending, I think I looked back at it recently and I was spending like no more than $50 a week, but most weeks I was spending like $25 a week on groceries. And so nobody wants to hear this, but one of the ways I did it is I was a vegetarian and people always think like, oh, eating healthy is expensive and vegetables are expensive. You know what's really expensive? Meat. Meat <laughs> is expensive. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And more and more every year. Like even chicken now, like I'm seeing is getting a lot more expensive in the store. Especially if you're getting like anything that isn't uh, on sale, anything that's labeled as organic is ridiculous, right? Yeah. All that stuff. Yeah. Well, and like, so when I was in college, a big thing I ate, potatoes. Potatoes are so cheap, <laughs> you know? And, and so I, I'm not here to like promote unhealthy eating for sure you know I don't think you should deprive yourself of nutrients and all that but there's a lot of things that you don't really need in your diet you never need junk food you never need sugar um you know you you just don't need these things so if you find yourself buying chips every week chips are expensive and you don't need them there's no nutritional value they're gonna leave you feeling unsatisfied at the end of the day if you're like me like if I open a bag of chips they're gone and then I feel like crap (laughs) <laughs> well, so they're by design. They're made to they're made to make you feel like you need to eat the whole bag. So, yeah. yeah. Um. So I think there's a lot of areas where, like, if you just you have to look at your lifestyle with a critical eye, though, and that can be really hard to do because I know even even myself personally, I waste money on going out to eat, and I know I do it. Yeah, but everything in moderation, though, too. So I mean, we just listed. I don't know, 10 different ideas for cutting back in different areas of your life, right? We're not saying go do everything tomorrow. You know, there's there's some things you can cut back on. You can cut back on your grocery list a little bit. Don't deprive yourself of like some of the snacks and stuff right off the ba- gate. Otherwise, you won't, you won't continue to do it, right? Uh, you know, we're firm believers in a little bit at a time. Cut back, chip away at some things. And then after like a couple years, you're going to be in such a great situation if you continue to just like chip away a little bit more at a time and feel comfortable with that chipping and then just chip away a little bit more it's just like savings right save a little bit you know and that turns into a little bit more and then you save a little bit more and that doubles it and you know it just it all compounds and again that snowball effect and and i think you'll like start finding how little in life you really need to be happy you know so like you know i cut back in so many areas and i've found myself like picking up hobbies and doing things that actually benefit me more, you know, it's so easy to sit in front of the TV and, you know, throw a mindless TV show on and eat some ice cream, right? Like, I think that's ever an idea of a good time. (laughs) Um, But, you know, like, in the past year, I've kind of tried to not do that as much. And I'll try to, you know, especially I'm still taking exams for my profession. So I'm like, no, I'm going to study a little harder instead of just watching mindless TV or, you know, we built a, we talked about in a different podcast, the dining room bench we built, and we learned a lot of skills doing that. And it takes time, but when you're wasting time, sometimes there's better ways to spend that time to actually, you save money and you gain skills. Right. And, you know, you'd be hard pressed to probably find somebody in that 30% that is doing well today that isn't a lifelong learner, right? Somebody that continues to find new skills, new talents, new hobbies, uh, you know, figures out new things, asks people about their hobbies and what they do and try out those different things. That seems to be a contagious mindset of some of those people as well. So if you can adopt some of those talents and get out of the ruts that, you know, Netflix wants you to be in, right? Or Hulu wants you to be in or... Comcast uh, especially because they charge the most. Right, yeah. (laughs) Comcast would love for you to just sit on the couch forever. Uh, Ben and Jerry's would too. But, you know, if you can if you can back away from some of those guys uh, for a little bit and get out and do something different, you know, that that kind of mentality and that kind of mindset helps you to in all the other areas of your life. Right? And, you know, I think it actually starts making you feel better, as cheesy as that sounds. You know, like I've gotten out and, you know, I started biking to work this year. And OK, sure. You know, my commute goes from 15 minutes when on days that I bike to 30 or days that I drive to 30 minutes days that I bike. So it's an extra half an hour round trip. But it's like half an hour where I'm 
out there, you know, in the fresh air, getting some exercise and especially living in the Midwest and going through winter. Like I was still biking in the winters when it was colder, but it's like, otherwise I'm never outside in the winter. So it actually was really good for me to like get that fresh air and get the body moving, get the blood flowing. And I found that when I got to work, I was like able to focus and do better work because I, you know, burned off some of that energy. Yeah, that's probably a more th- fun thing to do in the winter than shoveling the driveway, which is not so fun. <laughs> <laughs> but again, you know, shoveling your driveway instead of hiring it out saves some money. So. That's true, yep. Yeah. And it doesn't take that long, so. Um, so, yeah, I think that's something that we've never actually talked a lot about, and that's maybe a good thing to talk about. So, you know, we're, we're kind of preachers of don't spend a lot of money, pick up other hobbies. So what are some things that you've found yourself doing in the past year for fun, you know, what do you, what's your typical night or weekend and what are, what are you enjoying right now? I guess. Yeah. You, <laughs> <laughs> me. Oh man. Um, so, so we, you know, we, we did some initial investments into some paddle boards a couple years ago. And so those are, you know, to get some nicer ones of those, I mean, you can get some foam ones too, that are still pretty expensive. Some of the nicer ones are like a couple hundred bucks more expensive, but, um, you only buy it once. And every time you go, you can basically go for free because uh, we have a lot of lakes around us or, or you know, pond, not necessarily ponds, but small, some really small lakes, I suppose, um, that are, you know, just fun to go out on. They're, they're really smooth, really calm, um, you know, shallow water where people go like trolling for fish and stuff um, or people go out on kayaks. And so, you know, that's something that has been extremely inexpensive for us to do. We can just, you know, load up, go out on the car you know, drive five miles away, 10 miles away, and then boom, we're out on the lake for, and we spend a couple hours out on the lake and we get some exercise while we're doing it. It's pretty fun to go out there. It's beautiful scenery a lot of the times when we go out there, um, usually for like sunsets and things like that. Um, but that's, you know, that's been something that's been really inexpensive for us to do that we just had to, you know, pay for up front rather than something like I used to play paintball when I was in um, high school and college. And like every time you go out there, it's like a small fortune to go out there because if you go to yeah. a field, um, you can you can play cheaper if you have know somebody that has a bunch of property and you can go out in the woods and you can buy your own paint online in bulk. But if you go to like one of the fields or the speedball courses and you have to buy their paint, like they're making a fortune off of that stuff, right? So mm-hmm. and the guns themselves and you, you you mob them all the time and you continue enhancing and you can continue getting better gear and stuff. And that's that's almost a mentality of like, I have to keep investing in this to like, keep it like current and new. And, you know, there's a lot of money going into that. That's just kind of going nowhere. It's not even adding a whole lot of value to that. Yeah. But so, so I'm glad I'm not doing that as much, you know, snowboarding's of the same accord. You can, you know, buy things up front for pretty cheap. You can get stuff at like the ski swap or whatever it is at the, in the spring when people are offloading equipment, um, you know, for us in the, in the area of the country where you have some winter sports, grab that stuff while it's inexpensive going you can get like a season pass if you're close to some things um you know it's you can go a couple times and it's not that expensive you know sometimes you can get deals that are like 25 bucks to go for the whole day or something you know normally it's around like 40 to 60 to get away with some of that stuff um you know when you find it on deals and things like that but um get out and do some exercise and some winter sports and some hobbies and um try new things well yeah and like tennis is something else that we both enjoy and once you have your racket you know I I used to play tennis a lot as a kid, and sure, they say you should get it restrung, you know, every every four weeks or whatever when you're playing a lot. But honestly, when we're we're pretty casual players now. I mean, as a regular person, I've never gotten my racket (laughs) restrung. I don't even know what that would do. I hit the ball over the fence half the time (laughs) like that. Yeah, well, and that's what I mean, you know. I think in any hobby, you can choose to spend a lot of money, or you can choose to just have fun with it and you know, take it as it come and just enjoy it. And like, now we go out and we play tennis a few times a year and we can walk onto any courts nearby if, at any school in the summer and they're open to the public. We don't have to pay court fees. You know, we just bring our own balls, bring our own rackets and we can play for a couple hours and have a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something else we, you know, we've really enjoyed. Um, I think one of our most expensive, but also most profitable hobbies is actually real estate which we should probably do a whole nother podcast about because oh, we haven't really talked about yeah. that. But like, you know, personally, I just love looking at properties on Zillow. And then, you know, we, we've kind of started adding rental properties to our collection, which th- that is a hobby, though. I mean, think about how much time we spend analyzing cash flows and spreadsheets. And, you know, we spend a lot of time on that. 
And, you know, we've learned a lot in the, in the past year even about that. That's probably taken up a lot of our spare time in the past year. Oh, certainly. A little more than, you know, building the furniture did. Yeah. But it's a lot of, you know, it's basically a game almost. I mean, you're hunting for, like, the best deal and finding the right prices. And it's, like, down, you know, getting deep into the details. And then you got to compete with somebody else when you do find the good deals for the right things. And, you know, it's a, it's it's an exciting adventure. It's, a, you know, finding the right things, not just blowing our money, but spending the money correctly and finding something that's really, you know, doing a return on investment for us that is meeting meeting the numbers and, you know, is, is highly profitable. It's, it's all it's all very exciting. So. Yeah. And, you know, not just like, so ours is real estate, but I think, you know, I would recommend a lot of people look into different side hustles and side projects that you can do outside of your normal work because that'll find something that you love first of all you know for me I do love real estate I think it's really enjoyable um but I I've known people who have started Etsy shops or you know they've started different online businesses or different things or you know like my sister she works two jobs because she just really enjoys having a second job you know she loves it um so I think like if you can find something that you enjoy that's going to pay you, then you're kind of killing two birds with one stone because you're getting an extra ho- hobby and you're, you know, getting more free time filled, but you're also making more money. So. I'm all for that. Yeah. Um, so is there anything else we want to talk about on this whole topic of spending, getting in that mindset? I mean, I think for us it's kind of hard because we were both natural savers you maybe a little more so than me you know I think I used to spend a lot more especially in college like I would buy clothes all the time I had so many clothes like it's it was ridiculous um and you know I I've really come a long way in learning that like material possessions very rarely make me happy it kind of leaves me chasing the next thing and once I stopped and I just took a breather from all the material possessions I realized that like I can get so much more enjoyment and fulfillment by changing my hobbies. So instead of like going to the mall after work, when I hop on Zillow after work, it's, you know, more fun for me and it's better for my future. I I always, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I was always in the mindset of like, I always thought people were out to rip me off and like even buying clothes and going to the mall and stuff. I was like, you know, this is way too expensive for a pair of jeans or wait, these shirts are like nothing. Like why do they cost like 60 bucks for this, right? So I was always out looking for a deal, looking for a good value over anything else. And if, you know, I would just walk away if it was just, I couldn't find anything. Well, it, well and that kind of goes down to our family <laughs> motto, right? Buy the right thing. Yeah, buy the right thing, not the most expensive thing, not the cheapest thing, you know, not- But it people. could be the most expensive or the cheapest. Yeah. And the, it depends on the situation, right? I mean- I think that's something that, like, I think it's funny because I I think a lot of our friends know that about us, but, like, we research literally anything we buy. Even if it's, like, a coffee mug for me to take my coffee to work, like, I think it cost us $11, the last coffee mug we bought, and it took us, like, three months to buy it. (laughs) One, you got to get out of that mindset of, uh, of impulse spending. (laughs) <laughs> and right, and the other thing is, yeah, we we want, want to find the best product that is the right product for us. And so, right, and there's you know there's a bunch of stuff out there. Even though it's like ten bucks, I'm not just gonna like throw ten bucks away on something that's a piece of junk, right? I'm gonna find something that is like the proest thing I can possibly find for ten bucks. Right. Well, because I think you know what people don't realize is they're like, oh, well, it's just ten dollars. Okay, we'll take that ten dollars every week. For a year, and that's $520, right? And then if you put that in a mutual fund and you do that year over year over year, by the time you're 65, you're not just talking about $10. You're talking about tens of thousands of dollars difference in your retirement because of decisions you're making right now. And it goes back to what I said earlier. Like, it is the little things. The, the little things do add up. You know, people, I think sometimes people think I'm ridiculous because of the things that I choose to save money on or, you know, like I've been biking to work and I'm like, I'm saving so much money. And I, I, I think people kind of like laugh at me a little bit and they're like, she's a kook. You know, it's not saving her that much money. I, I analyzed our budget for the first six months of the year and my transportation, well, our transportation costs are down $2,000 this year because... You know, we moved to a little bit more convenient part of town. And because we're biking to the farmer's market and we're biking, you know, I'm biking to work. 
it makes a difference. I, I don't think people understand how expensive all these things end up being. Oh, for sure. But, you know, I'm, I'm also of the camp of I don't want to just have extra stuff at the end. Like, so 10 years, right, is what you were giving the example, you know, a minute ago. Um, if I have the coffee mug, and when we say coffee mug, we really mean like thermos that keeps your coffee hot on the way to work and for several hours after the fact, right? So it keeps my coffee hot until two thirty. The, the end. Of, the end of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the end of ten years, right? I don't want to just have like a bunch of junk that I find in my cupboards of my kitchen. I want to find like that I'm still using that mug because it was such a good purchase that it was the right thing at the time. It's the right thing 10 years from now and it still works and there was nothing that ever broke with it, right? Not that I've got like six in the cabinet because I kept buying stuff that like wasn't great and I didn't throw them away and now I just have a pile of junk in my kitchen. So it's taken up space and it is a it's a basically a a trophy wall for my failures <laughs> over time. Yeah. Well, and I think that's something hard for us is we very much are of that mentality that like, if what we have still works, we're not going to buy new or different or change it out. Like, we're still using the plates that my sisters, when I went to college, bought me plates from the dollar store. And we still use those plates because there's nothing wrong. They're great plates, actually. I love them. Um, (laughs) And there's nothing wrong with them. And so we're not going to get rid of them. We're not going to get new plates. We're not going to get... We don't have a matching set of, like, plates and bowls. But, you know, and some people are like, oh, well, you need that at a certain age for dinner parties. We love hosting dinner parties. Nobody has ever been like, oh, my God, I can't eat at your house because you don't have matching plateware. They get matching plateware when it's paper. That's what they get. Well, not even paper because we usually buy those on sale and they're different prints. Oh, that's true. Um, But, you know, my point is, like, you don't always have to, like, do these things that society tells you to do. Like... Honestly, it's not going to make me any happier to be eating off of, like, a, a matching plate, you know? That just doesn't change my life. It doesn't make a difference. So I think, like, just ask yourself, like, do I really want this? And if you if yes, then figure out how to get it. But if not, don't do it. And don't let anybody tell you you need it, you right. know? And, and like I always say, right, how many cheeseburgers is it worth? Right? Well, and I, <laughs> you know, I think, and we'll wrap this up soon because I know the podcast is getting a little long here, but... You know, when we got married last year, we kind of did it a little unconventional way. You know, we didn't have a big wedding. We did a very small, intimate ceremony with just very close friends and family. And, like, we don't have any regrets about that. And our wedding was... The average wedding is, like, twenty five or $30,000 these days. Ours was a very small, small fraction of that. And at the end of the day, like, we're still married check <laughs> you know and and so i i urge you and i'm not telling you know if you want that big wedding and you're saving for it and you're planning for it i'm not here to judge you i'm very happy for you know to see that you know a lot of my friends and family have had bigger nicer weddings and they've been wonderful and they've been perfect for that those people and that person but for us we didn't want that and you know a lot of people were like oh you know you're gonna regret this or you're gonna wish it was different at the end of the day now we're married and i'm like nope it was perfect, you know? Yeah, I mean, we had a great time. It's in And perceived value is all subjective, right? So for some people, like, having that special, huge, you know, 300-person wedding or, you know, even 100-person wedding, uh, you know, is kind of in that ballpark nowadays. That's what they want to have. They've been planning for that for years, right? They've thought about it a tremendous amount. And that perceived value makes sense for them. But what we continue to say is make the conscious decision. Know that you're spending that much know that that is adding the value to your life know that you could be spending that money in other areas and you are choosing to spend it in this area you don't have to right yeah people people do it cheaper all the time you don't have to spend that amount of money you don't have to have this like huge venue or you know big caterer or you know five tier wedding cake or whatever that is um uh just it's a choice so right choose to do it that's totally fine uh you know but you don't have to well and I, you know i think just just because we're on the subject like and instead of having this wedding, which we could have afforded to have, we decided to buy a condo, which I think is, like, very not traditional. Um, but for us, like, we were like, you know, we have this money saved up, and this is what we want to do. And, like, for us, that fit our relationship. Like, anybody who knows this would be like, of course, instead of having a wedding, they bought a condo, right? Um, but... So then, you know, sometimes I'm talking to people and they're like, well, how did you afford your first rental property at such a young age? And I'm like, it's all decisions that you make, right? And so 
every single decision that you make matters. And so we, you know, we made this decision to forego something that most people want to get something else, right? And it's it goes back to like pros and cons and trade-offs and cost benefit, right? And we've talked about opportunity costs, right? Oh yeah, opportunity costs. And these are all things we've talked about in the past. So it's just one of those things that, yeah, analyze I, maybe we're just both analytical people, but I think if people really like focused on like, you know, I, so I help a lot of people budget and they'll be like, oh, well, my goal is to, you know, buy a new car in the next year. And then I start doing their budget. And I'm like, this is clearly not your number one goal. You know, your number one goal is getting manicures, right? <laughs> um, and so I think like once people realize like, okay, to get this, this is what I need to sacrifice. Is it worth it? And if the answer is no, then, you know, you just need to figure out what's more important to you. Right. Because mo- for most people, based on their income, they can't have it all, right? So I, I don't think anybody, I mean, unless you're, like, so wealthy, you know, you're on next level. Like, I, th- I think very few of us can afford to have it all. So it's all making decisions and making the best decisions. And I just urge you to make those decisions. Do not go into debt. Yeah, don't. keep Keep out of debt. And, and when you're making those decisions, say, you know... Would I be happier with the dollar, right? If you're looking at that cup of coffee and you say, you know, would I be just happier with the dollar to go to go toward my goal, right? Just and think and of I think way. sometimes you need to like visualize that because it's so easy in the moment to be like, well, this is only a dollar. But I think if you can realize like every dollar counts, whether, you know, I've seen some people make Excel charts where they fill in different cells. I've seen some people make like thermometers where they, you know, fill up <laughs> the, the thermometer, like visualize it because every dollar does count. So if you're, you know, at the coffee shop and you're like, oh, it's only a couple bucks or, you know, you're going through McDonald's drive through and you're like, oh, it's only a couple bucks, like those couple bucks start adding up. And so for me, what I do is every single month I look at all my past purchases that month. And I'm like, what areas did I spend too much? Because then that helps me like the next month be like, okay, so sure, this is only $2 right now to get, you know, a meal at McDonald's or whatever. But last month I spent, you know, I was $20 over in my fast food budget. Right. And, and we've, we've mentioned this before, right? Using a tool like mint.com to be able to track your spending, you know, just give you transparency into what you're doing. You know, knowledge is power. So if you can see where your money's going, you can react to it and you can see, you know, it, it eliminates that, that focus of, you know, I'm just spending a dollar here and there because you see at the end of every month, wow, my dollar here and there was like $400. And you know what I think is kind of fun and we can end on this note is have like a no spend week or a no spend month. I mean, no spends months are a little harder, but do a no spend week where like, you know, kind of plan ahead and be like, okay, I'm going to have a full tank of gas and I'm going to have food in the fridge. But then, like, see how many days you can go without spending money. Because, like, I think that really helps, like, reset everything. Then you're not like, oh, it's just a dollar. It's like, oh, no, I I can't spend money today because that would break the streak. And I'm very competitive, so these little, like, mind games really help keep me on the right path. Oh, yeah, we've done this before a couple times. You know, really, if you end up, if we end up doing something that's, like, a large purchase or we, you know, end up spending too much money, especially around the holidays when you're getting Christmas presents and things for people, you know, you really go into, you know, cost saving or, you know, spending, cutting spending mode and, you know, cutting everything out. And it's a, it's a game. Right. Challenge yourself to like not going out to eat and be like every time you want to go out to eat, be like, I've got stuff in the fridge. I planned for this. Right. So I need to eat it up, even though it's a lot easier to go out to eat. Right. When you've challenged yourself to do it, you're more likely to win. Well, and I think, you know, kind of going to challenging yourself, it's even like we keep our thermometer pretty low in the winter and pretty high in the summer. And it's like you kind of challenge your comfort zone of like sometimes our house is a little hot, but like, gosh, I'm not going to pay to keep it at like 68 degrees right it's going to be at 78 and we're going to adjust and adapt right and do an experiment and wow that experiment turns out to be a couple hundred bucks uh you know over the summer so that that, that's an experiment that really pays off for you yeah (laughs) um so i think we'll kind of end on this note but that's kind of where our mindset is and our mentality is with saving so if we missed anything or if you're like oh you know i this is how I save, or these are the mind tricks I use. I'd love to hear them, so go ahead and email me, and I'll drop contact information in below. 
Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Money in the Bank. Make sure to subscribe to us on the iTunes or Stitcher app so that you get weekly alerts every time we post a podcast. Or if you want, you can visit my website, moneyinthebankpodcast.com. And if you want to reach out with any questions or further comments, please email me at angie at moneyinthebankpodcast.com. I look forward to hearing from you. Money in the Bank.